We're talking about the lions of God. Okay, kids, we're going to go to your Sunday school. Have a great time. Praise God. Praise God, everybody. Wow, what incredible worship songs. Aren't those amazing? Just to worship God and be in it for my What a beautiful, beautiful. Oh, my, my, my. Don't want to hear me. Okay, the lions of God. Woo! Ready to look into this. Let's go first to Hosea 5. This read, oh, I just want to mention before we do that, Jesse's in the Philippines, so let's pray for him, everybody, you know, at the end, we'll pray for him and for his speedy return. He's uh, doing what he does best, evangelizing across the globe, <laughs> you know, so we, we just we pray for him and we hope that he comes back quick and in good health, amen? Yeah. All right, so we have five today, from the first thing. The princes of Judah were like them that removed the bow. Therefore, I will pour out my wrath upon them like water. This is, this is God. Ephraim, one of the tribes of Israel, is oppressed and, in, and broken in judgment because he willingly walked after the commandment. Therefore, will I be unto Ephraim as a moth and to the house of Judah as rottenness. When Ephraim saw his sickness and Judah saw his wound, then went Ephraim to the Assyrian and sent to King Jareb. Yet could he not heal you nor cure you of your wound? For I will be unto Ephraim as a lion and as a young lion to the house of Judah. I, even I, will tear and go away. I will take away, and none shall rescue him. I will go and return to my place till they acknowledge their offense and seek my face. In their affliction, they will seek me early. Amen. This is Hosea, of course, prophesying and uh, warning the people of Israel that they must return to God. It's important to remember when the Lord return, returns, he is not the lamb to be slain. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah. That's very important. As the, I just want to keep that in mind as we go through this. I was uh, preparing, you know, yesterday, and my kids were on the ground, you know, on the TV, in front of the TV, and they were playing a game. And this game is called Call of Duty. I'm sure you've seen this. <laughs> And it's a game where, you know, they're <coughs> out there and, uh, you know, the world is collapsing and it's desolate. And, uh, you know, all, ma you know, manner of evil has broken loose. So there are these army men who are going into this world. These are, of course, cities that have become ravaged and now there's wars in them. Desolation everywhere. And, you know... We saw this, and I, I, felt, I felt, just watching this, I felt myself get very stressed even watching the videos. <laughs> you know, here they are, they're running through, and, you know, they're killing all their enemies, and etc. like this. There's helicopter scenes. This is probably L.A. or Miami or something. And uh, it's just desolation everywhere. And it's so scary because our world, this may be a reality in our world. As the dollars are collapsing, as Russia is cutting off oil to Europe, this is what we see in the beginning of World War II. There's such an incredible crisis that the world is facing. And I remember very clearly when we were in the palace, we spoke very clearly, if Father is erased, if he is, if the things that he left are taken away, they're desecrated, then there will be judgment. Judgment will come. There will be an external judgment that we see in the world, and there will be an internal judgment. And it was interesting because what I remember when I had to tell mother this. I told her, mother, father is going to only give us three years. 
because of His loving kindness, because of His love for us. I had no idea that it was the year of the Shemitah. Had no idea that, you know, the two major collapses in 2001 and 2008 fall on exactly the biblical day of nullification on the Shemitah years, Elul 29. And I had no idea that this year was a super Shemitah. I had no idea. I had no idea. Just a still small voice inside me said, we don't have so much time. If we desecrate what Messiah has left us, we, their ju a judgment will come. And that judgment will not be of hate. And it's not because he can't control his, his emotions. It's because we have departed from him. And that the only way for him to bring his people back is to do what that scripture said. Return to my place. They acknowledge their offense. In their affliction, they will see me early. I was watching this game, and look, and I just, it's just, they just glamorize war, you know, as we face this external crisis in the world. It's interesting how providence always meant mirrors external and internal. But I'm just watching that. I'm getting so stressed looking at this. I'm thinking, my God. <laughs> you know, the last 50 years, we've had peace on earth. But who knows what we'll bring now as the, as the uh, systems are collapsing. Mm -hmm. The bubbles are bursting. And as, as we know, I asked my children, I said, hey guys, who starts wars, uh, you know, that children have to go die in? And they said, they're very educated. They said, the bankers? <laughs> I was like, whoa, you guys, how do you know that? Huh? You're not sleeping during the seven, huh? <laughs> and it was just so, we were talking about the glamorization of war. How even the establishment systems will use video games and propaganda like this to stimulate young people to actually want to become these kind of external warriors. Fooling them that the battle is between flesh and blood, not between, not a spiritual battle that we face. We talked about so many of these issues with them. Army recruitment is up at a high since the Vietnam War. They're making their numbers like crazy because the video games. We discussed these things and I talked to them and said, well, what, well, what happens if this becomes reality on the year of the Shemitah or, or, or not, but in the near future? What will we do? It's very scary because you know, when I told that warning, and Coach also, of course, warned three years as well, but as we gave that warning to the church hierarchy, I remember my wife telling me, she said, she said, hubby, you know, she said, uh, uh, maybe don't say like three years. Don't be so specific. <laughs> because what if nothing happens in three years? Why do you have to say like a certain time? And I just said, I don't know. I don't know, but I feel that we're giving a warning. That if we do these things and desecrate the holy temple, there will be judgment. This has just happened. It was interesting because as I gave the sermon, breaking the silence, and that went viral throughout the world church, I think, what is it now, like 12,000 views or 11,000 views, something like that? And um, on that same weekend in Korea, there was the start of big demonstrations in front of the church headquarters building. Talk about harbingers, warning signs that God is giving directly to the center of the world church. This, of course, is coming in at the same time that the Korean government has now openly begun 
and sent in the Korean IRS to investigate Chung Kung Group, Sege Ilbo, etc. So now the IRS is going in for investigation. But that's not all, because the district attorney is also going in for criminal investigation. And of course, nobody will tell you that, because you're not supposed to know about those things. The church, the center of the church, the world church, is now coming under criminal investigation by secular powers. If you read the Harbinger, talk about Harbingers, my God, talk about a warning to the people. Talk about a warning at the center of it all. In the year of the Shemitah, the super Shemitah, So we see this actually happening. The judgment is beginning. The warnings are getting stronger and harder. The sad part of this is because they've taken mother hostage, there she is now in legal danger. Which of course, especially Kukjo with his expertise, 2012 or earlier than that, told them that they would have if they do not let Chung Kung be audited, etc. We warned them so clearly that these things would happen. Honestly, when we were giving the warnings myself, I felt some doubt. I felt, well, oh, three years is a quite a short period of time to have a world, worldwide movement start collapsing. I mean, he had built up the organizations and the business groups so strong in Korea, in Japan, I mean, I was, I was thinking, three years? Yeah, I mean, you've got to be pretty skilled to destroy all that in three years. I mean, you really have to be talented. So I thought maybe, maybe 10 years. You know, I'm saying three years. I'm giving the warning of three years. But I'm thinking in my heart, probably 10 years. <laughs> maybe 20 years. It's unbelievable how fast. The judgment is coming. How fast the warnings are becoming real. They're becoming real. <coughs> and of course, these are the things that they don't want you, the world church, or viewers for watching around the world, do not want you to see. Because they want everybody to think, happy, happy, happy. Everything's wonderful. Everything's the same. You know? Nothing's wrong. Nobody behind the curtains, behind mother. There's no wizard behind the curtains. Pay no attention to the man, men behind the curtain, men and women behind the curtain, two men and women behind the curtain. But I was, we were just meditating on this, and we were kind of shocked because this is these are outside groups, you know, that are coming and demonstrating. <coughs> And as the government is now directly investigating, that's why, at least that's what I've heard, that's why mother is stuck in Hawaii. She can't go back into the country. My God, what, what a tremendous, tremendous harbinger in God's warning. The fact that the queen can't even go back to her palace should be a clear warning and a clear sign. It should be crystal clear. But we have so many who cannot break free from their denial. It's interesting because this week has been quite a tremendous week. I mean, um, I don't, you know, personally, I don't think these kind of sermons are good for my health. Because I get, I just... You know, you get heart palpitations and all that kind of stuff, even after the fact. And just this week, it's been so crazy. As soon as that sermon went out, about the hidden rulers and all that, we started getting comments and stuff like that. People 
<coughs> saying, you know, just slander me. This is totally evil. You're attacking your mother. You're leaving your proper position and multiplying evil. You read the divine principle, all this kind of stuff. Of course, I could use those exact same arguments on them. That's what's so ridiculous. Of course, I didn't. I don't. I don't have to respond to those kind of ridiculous trolling. And so, I, it was amazing to see how much gut reaction, vitriol, denial, defense mechanism was going on as Satan was being exposed. But something started happening. It was amazing. Probably during the middle of the week, something started happening. It was like things started turning around. All the vitriolic comments started receding. And then I got all these private emails and PM messages, private messages, sent to me on YouTube, PM messages sent on Facebook, dozens of them from Switzerland, Poland, UK, Australia, United States, where, around the world, Japan, Korea, people sending me private messages. They're too scared to put it publicly. I, I understand that. They're sending me private messages saying, my God, True Father is back! And, you know, I'm going to sing the national anthem. I'm going to recite the Trinity Prayer. I get all these mails start pouring in. I'm thinking, my God. And you can see a spirit world change, a, a whole change in the whole spiritual atmosphere. And I remember watching, that, looking at this happening day to day. And I was watching a Christian pastor, um, wife, pastor's wife, Lisa Bevere. She was preaching on an event she had in her own life where she was led to a scripture in Chronicles that talked about the lioness and the lions. And this really ministered to me. I shared a little bit with you guys in Bible study. But this really ministered to me as I'm feeling all this emotion and seeing all these things happen. And in that, in that, in that, in that word, she was talking about how when the second coming comes, he comes as the lion, as prophesied in the book of Revelation. He doesn't come as the sweet little lamb. He comes with all authority of heaven and earth. He comes to judge the unrighteous. He comes as the lion of the tribe of Judah. And she went on to say, she went on to look into that scripture that said the lionesses must arise. And she, she went in to depict how the church, as the bride of Christ, is actually the lioness. The lioness that is beautiful, but is dangerous. She was talking about living in the light, but hunting in the dark. Hunting the enemy. Learning to become lionesses. Living in the light, but hunting in the dark. How lions can see in the dark even amidst darkness and confusion, lions can see through the dark. They can see their enemy in the dark. Oh, how the church has to begin to start praying dangerous prayers. Prayers that are dangerous. That prayers, when the enemy starts hearing, he will start shaking in his boots. She talked about how we have to regain our fierceness as the body of Christ. As the bride of Christ. The power and the fierceness that comes in wanting to protect our king. She went on to talk about how the lion is gentle. It's loving to its cubs, to its pride. But to its enemies, it brings terror. It brings fear. 
It is a killer in terms of power. It is fearfully made, wonderfully and fearfully made. She talked about how the lioness, when you see it walking across the, 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 the prairie, it's a stunning sight to see. It's stunning. And in that same vein, the body of Christ is supposed to be stunning. Stunning, not dumbed down to just be beautiful. Stunning meaning you must stun the enemy. Just by your presence, you must bring fear into the enemy. Stun him in his tracks. When he sees you who stand with Christ, he should stop. He should pay respect. He should be scared. That's what it means to be stunning. We are a stunning body, amen? <laughs> it means you stun the prey. You stun the enemy. The roar paralyzes its prey. The roar paralyzes its prey. Kucho had a chance to hunt lion. And he had the experience of sitting behind a straw grass blind with 400 pound lions walking around in the middle of nowhere in Africa. And you know I wasn't on that trip. <laughs> but he's in this mat, straw mat hole and he sees this lion come up and they have these, you know, they have dead carcasses. That's a great idea. <laughs> Bloody dead carcasses. And the lion comes and he said that when he heard it roar, his bones trembled. <laughs> you know what I mean, Brother Muhammad? He said his bones literally trembled. Because the lion, when it roars, it has these huge wavelengths. The sound waves are so big because the roar is so deep that the waves actually pass through your body. It can, be, it can go for five miles in the savannah. And it passes through your body. You literally become paralyzed when the lion opens its mouth. <laughs> when the lions start opening their mouth, Satan gets paralyzed, folks. That is what we are doing in this hour. Satan gets paralyzed. Notice that the lion also guards and takes control and takes back the territory that is their prime. It guards and takes back the territory. And notice also that the lionesses are multipliers. They multiply. They multiply in terms of the enemy fear. They multiply their presence. They multiply their army of wars. And what a day that it is that we have to witness that there is something brewing underground now under the world church where people are, have to go secretly back to Messiah and back to singing. You're, you're now hearing it. Whispers of the song, Blessing of Glory, being sung underground. Who would have ever known that you had to sing the Blessing of Glory underground? But that roar is getting louder. That roar is starting to gather, gather strength. And guess what? Satan is scared. He's very scared. When Joshua and Caleb had to defeat all the kings, we many times think Moses went through the wilderness and he was wandering like in circles for like, you know, 40 years. But my wife was doing a Bible study in Korean. And the teacher actually was showing that it was only about, they only wandered for about two years, and then they settled for about 38 years, where they started gathering and started, started getting the people in Israel together. 
And it's fascinating because as soon as I heard 38 years, it's like, oh my goodness, that's almost like 38 months since Father passed. And you start seeing, then they start moving to take Jericho. What's so interesting in this scripture, let's look at the scripture, Joshua 6. Because when they are now at the walls, they have defeated many of the kings, but they're now at the walls of Jericho. And look at what the scripture says. Let's read this together. Jericho was shut up tight as a drum because of the people of Israel. No one going in, no one coming out. But God spoke to Joshua. He said, look sharp now. Look stunning, right? Look sharp. I've already given Jericho to you along with its king and its crack troops. You see, once we realize that God has already won the victory and once we just simply come into agreement with Him and start declaring the victory over Satan is when the walls of Jericho begin to crumble. It is when we stay in agreement with God who already has given the victory to us that the king and the crack troops start falling. This was so amazing. It was like something had changed from just by speaking out, just by roaring out the last two weeks, just by trying to speak out and tell the truth. It feels like there's a huge change already. Satan is already feeling the pressure. I hear rumors that he's trying to change the covenant vows back trying to, you know, use mother as a puppet to do that. But see, that's why we couldn't talk about it for three years. People ask, why are you talking about it now on the third year of Father's Session? Because if we told you this before, nobody would believe us. But now for two years, you've seen it. You've seen the changes that we're pointing out. And they're historically re registered. They cannot deny that they did that. This was in a newspaper article, and this was during the whole situation with, you know, the quad group and all this kind of thing. And you all probably remember when Father wrote, he wrote a declaration. He wrote a declaration that said that I will be his inheritor, and that anybody else will be, what he used his words, a destroyer and a heretic. That's what he said. That's not my words, that's Father's words. You guys heard this, right? Yes. Now we thought that that only meant, that only was applying to that certain situation at that time. Who knew, who knew that the actual church would be standing in that same position, convicted by the words written by True Father after his passing? Who knew? Who knew? Who could have known? Only Father, only Messiah knew. Nobody could have imagined that they would desecrate him like they did. Secretly, behind doors, using the Queen to do so. And who, and what's so fascinating about this is when you actually look at the Signed paper. Look at it right here. Also, mother signed it. So even by her own pen, the whole hierarchy that has seek to erase father secretly is convicted. The victory is already done. See, when God was talking to Joshua, he said the victory is already done. Jericho is already done. And I felt this week, so strong that God was just saying, the victory is already done. The victory is done. It is done. The strongholds of Satan will break. The chains fall now. And all we have to do is come into agreement with God's word. 
That's what's so amazing. When Gideon's armies were ready to face the Midianites, and they had 32,000 men, but the Midianites had 135,000 men. That's a huge odds against you. And they had to face this humongous power. But God said, He said, I'm going to, just in case you beat them, I don't want you to think that it's because of your abilities that you beat the Midianites. So he actually, God says, send 10,000 back. So now they have 22,000. And then God says, well, that's not, a, that's not good enough. You're still going to believe. You're still going to think if you beat them and the odds are high against you. But if you beat them, you're still going to think you did it. So God then tells them, have all your men drink from the water in the stream. And the ones that drink like dogs lapping up the water, send them home. You remember this story, right? And the ones that drink, like, you know, with little bowls of hands and drink like this with water, they will stay with you. Only 300 of them drank like this. God said, send them all home. Now Gideon's standing there with 300 people against 135,000, thousand killers, trained killers, 300 versus 135,000 trained killers. God said to Gideon, he said, go down, if you don't believe that you'll win, go down to the camp and listen. So Gideon goes down to the camp and there's somebody in the tent that's talking about a dream that they had. And in that dream it said, I saw a bread roll roll down and hit our tent. And then in that tent, the guy says, Gideon is coming. The next morning, or that night, they come in, 300 men, and they wipe out the entire Midianite army. Only 15,000 were able to flee. They destroyed, demolished an army hundreds of times bigger. Why? Because they stood with God, folks. They stood with God. Because you know what? Once we stand with God, and once we Discover that we are the lionesses. That is the church. That is to defend the lion of Judah. That is to defend the pride of Judah. That is to defend the honor of the lion of Judah. The king, Messiah. Once we realize that, the hyenas come. The hyenas come cackling. The hyenas come in the night trying to breed fear, insecurity, doubt, trying to judge our faith, trying to peer pressure us to go along with the status quo because it makes them feel more comfortable. But guess what? One lion can chase away an entire pack of hyenas. When it discovers its fierceness, when it does not cower before the hyenas, but when it stands in its strength, and when it understands its created glory to defend the king, one lioness defeats a pack of hyenas. Just in the middle of the week, I just wanted after listening to all this stuff and seeing these things happening and the spiritual shift happening and turning and this underground movement now coming where 
we're almost rediscovering, Father, this underground wave that is happening in secret. And I just opened up my Bible and I fell on 148. And it said, Praise ye the Lord. Praise ye the Lord from the heavens. Praise Him in the heights. Praise ye Him, all His angels. Praise ye Him, all His hosts. Praise ye Him, sun and moon. Praise Him, all ye stars of light. Praise Him, ye heavens of heavens, and ye waters that be above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for He commanded, and they were created. He had also established them forever and ever and had made a decree which shall not pass. Shall not pass. The decrees that the lion has set shall not pass. Even though you try to erase them, you got caught, boy. And the decrees stay forever. Leave our proper position, you see. Yeah. You see? Right. Because in my position, crowned three times, I'm supposed to stand for the king. Yeah. I'm not supposed to stand for your political correctness or your little pressure. I'm supposed to stand for the Lion of Judah. That's right. See, I didn't leave my position. If I went along with you, I would have left my position. The lions are beginning to roar. The lioness is beginning to roar. And there's fear. Look at those teeth. Man, that's scary. Look at those teeth. You thought it was a cuddly little kitten. Look at them teeth. You thought this is a nice, silky, soft, bald head. It is, but look at them teeth. You better watch out. The lions are coming. They're starting to roar, and they're starting to rumble. And now, your time is up. We were in the wilderness on Friday. The bushcrafters, sanctuary bushcrafters. <laughs> Minus 30 degrees Celsius winds. <coughs> One of the coldest nights we've been out there, right, guys? Woo! Just brutal, brutal, brutal winds. The night was freezing cold, but the morning was even more brutal because as we woke, we were on a ridge and the wind was pounding us. And it was minus 30 degrees Celsius winds. It was freezing cold. And we did our hymn, okay, we sang the national anthem. The lions were roaring in the wilderness. We sang the national anthem. We did the Chaniku Kuka, the family pledge. And we read a scripture. We have my small little Bible there. And we turned to Luke 6, and this was very interesting. Because God gave us another message. This was a story where the scribes and Pharisees were watching Jesus. Whether he would heal on the Sabbath day. That they may find an accusation against him. But he knew their thoughts and said to the man which had the withered hand, Rise up and stand forth in the midst. Rise up and stand in the midst of your persecutors. Rise up. And stand in the midst. And he arose and stood forth. Look at that. He agreed with Christ and stood forth. Then said Jesus unto them, I will ask you one thing. Is it lawful on the Sabbath day to do good or to do evil? To save life or to destroy it? And looking round about upon them all, he said unto the man, Stretch forth thy hand. And he did so. He agreed with Christ. And his hand was restored whole as the other. And they were filled with madness. They were filled with madness and communed one with another that what they may do to Jesus. 
See, when Jesus comes to the room, when Messiah comes into the picture, all the machinations of the Pharisees get maddened. When Christ comes in and we stand with Christ, with Messiah, when we stand with Him, when we come into agreement with Him in the midst, and we stand forth, the enemy is filled with madness. Madness. You see, it shows how weak Satan really is. He has illusions of power, illusions of big hierarchies and big churches and big palaces, etc. Woo! Illusions. Because when you actually stand in spirit and in truth and resist him, when you stand in the midst of him, when you stand up and agree with Messiah, then he begins to flee. He begins to run. He begins to hide. And he begins to say, oh, no, 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 I heard there's rumors they're trying to change the vows back, just like I predicted last week. I knew it, of course we know it. But we have the historical record. You see how weak Satan is? He's such a coward. He's so weak. He's so debilitating. He's such a cripple that when you actually challenge his Perceived illusory strength, it starts crumbling before his very Amen. Because you know why? Because yeah. the Lion of Judah brings fear to the hyena. Because the Lion of Judah makes some new marks on that hyena booty. Because the Lion of Judah, when he opens his velvet claw, huh, becomes claws that can rip you in half. Because when we stand with the Lion of Judah, all oh, hyenas, run, 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 baby. Look at it, he's squealing, he's squealing in terror. Isn't God good? The hyenas. They got to, oh, I love how that claw is right on that boots. <laughs> love that. You got to love that thing. And look how calm the lion is. <laughs> He's just like... <laughs> That's incredible, Victor, right there. I'm like, you want to say something? Uh, Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I see... Um, prepare this sermon with a bunch of lions, right? That lion is. I, what, I was like praying what I should speak this week. And then um, all of a sudden, you know, I almost like, I feel like I heard a gospel with Yona. You talk about your testimony. So, oh, uh, but I shared it before. But you can share it again. So that's why I'm, I, today I'd like to share my, one of my testimony. And actually, and my father and my mother was matched in this big room by father. <coughs> and father said, oh, you and you. And you know, my father stood up and my mother stood up. And you know, my mother was kind of a very tall lady for her age. And my father was kind of short. And then father said, to father said, oh, so will you get blessed with him? And mother said, oh, She's kind of short. <laughs> I guess she, she thought that in her mind, right? And then Father asked her again second time, are you going to get blessed with him? And she was like, she, Father, it was interesting. Father did not ask him, my father, about his opinion. He was asking my mother about her opinion about him. So my mother didn't answer. So third time he asked again, she thought, ask my mother again, are you going to get blessed with him? And she said, oh, she reluctantly said, oh, okay, yes. <laughs> and 
father blessed her heart and said, and her father said, you know what? Your offspring will be good. You will have a general in your children, so do it. It's good. Good match. <laughs> and okay, my mother did it. And then I have to say, my mother and father is not really, they were not really a uh, lovey-dovey couple. They were a very typical, stiff Korean couple. <laughs> and, you know, only hope my mother had in the family, she was like, okay. Father promised me, promised me that I'm going to have a generate in my children. So she had a first child, it was daughter. And second child, it was daughter. And third child, which is me, a daughter again. So my mother was like, what happened to the promise? Didn't you promise me? Like this. And then five years later, my mother had my younger brother. And when she had my younger brother, Actually, she, he was born as an oxygen deficiency in his brain. So he was born in handicap. And for five years, he was in the vegetable state. He couldn't speak, he couldn't walk, and he couldn't basically function as a normal person. And my, oh, it became a, such a, a big pain and big agony for my mother. And then she, I was a child who used to take care of my younger brother because I was right above him. <laughs> And I heard my mother say, Father promised me that I'm going to have a general. What happened to our family? And she was saying this over and over. And then somehow, it really got to me. Got to me saying, yeah, that's right. Why did Father say, made a promise that he cannot even keep? That's ridiculous. And I, I, it became a clutch for me to get, it, it became a, um, how to say, it, I, I couldn't get, um, leap, I can't jump, I can't, it, it became a, such an um, obstacle, hurdle, <laughs> to overcome, to, to love God more. Because you know what? He, he, he says one thing, but maybe that's not true. That was always in my heart. He said he bled, you will bless us, but he did the opposite thing to us. And then that became a, such a um, deep doubt, and it created deep doubt and suspicion toward God. And then, and then I joined the true family member, and I had five children, and I'm very grateful. And then one day, it was in Las Vegas, we were attending true father, and then all of a sudden he looked at me. He was looking at this way. I was sitting right there with my husband. He was looking at me and, okay, Yana, you come out and do your testimony. I'm like, oh, Father, you could at least give me some clothes or you're going to make me speak, for Christ's sake. But anyway, I, I went out, you know, and then I started to speak about how grateful I am. And you knew that my brother was a, such a such, but you still accept me as true family member. And then, uh, you know, Make me uh, get married with my wonderful, handsome, awesome, do you want to add more? To husband, I'm very grateful. And he was like, mm, okay. And then, you know what? I have to say, Father's oh, that one word made me liberate the, the, the worry and the doubt that I had in my heart for decades and decades. And I have to say, this was the moment that I was saved by by Lord. Because many times, you know, we we as a second gen, we never enter into church, right? We sometimes, when did you come? To, when did you enter into church? We, we second, first gen, they like I like to ask each other, right? But we second generation, we were born to enter the church, right? Yeah. So it was not really like a, we don't have that moment. But you know what, that's why I love to say that was a moment I was saved by, by my Lord. And that was that moment. I feel like I was thunderstruck, actually. And I, my, I, I began to open my heart because he's one word. He said, you know what? You can be general for, for, for God. That's what he said. Because, wow, that's right. He already gave me the promise. He already kept the promise, but I didn't realize it. Because I was limiting his blessing in my own human tiny mind. 
He already blessed us. And then, you know what? My, after that amazing moment, I started thinking in the human, humanist eyes, you know what, okay, me becoming general, oh, that's amazing. But you know what, I'm such a fearful, scary cat. How am I going to become a general? <laughs> See, general is somebody like, okay, let's go, and command. And I'm not that kind of person. I, I'm a person, you know, rather hide in the back. And how can I become a general? My gosh, that's a, it's demanding too much. That's a, maybe that's not a blessing. That, that, that's something I cannot, never fulfill. But as my husband preparing this uh, lioness sermon, I realized that we actually become live a life centered on the Lord, centered on our our Christ. Then you know what? I realized that He actually eradicates all the fear we have, and He makes us as a new creature. And then when we become a new creature, when we become his, then we become a, a warrior, heavenly warrior. Yes. 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 And that was what he was talking about. Many times, you know, we women, we think, okay, Father said we have to become a soldier, we have to become like a, a you know, general. And, and I even thought that I had to become a war, I have to become a, like a man, and whatever. But you know what, actually, what he was saying is that you have to live one with Christ. Man and woman, not just the feminist who wants to, you know, who wants to say, I am higher than man, I'm stronger than man, and all that. You know, he's not talking about that. When man and woman and come together, that's a woman's real empowerment. Living a life centered on God and come together with your husband as a helper. The position that God gave us, that's not the diminishing position. Amen. That is a glorifying Amen. position that God gave us. Isn't that beautiful? Why do we have to do the Who put that to the thought? When we do that, we can become God's lions, right? To glorify and to build His kingdom. Amen. 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 After we come into a parent-child relationship with God, when the son wails in sorrow, God the Father will also wail in sorrow. Then Satan will be frightened out of his senses and will flee. I want to give God some praise today. I'd like you to grab your neighbor's hand and lift him. Let's lift him. We have the victim. Let's lift. We have the victim. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. This holy anointing that you're pouring out on the people of God. Father, it is now time for us to remember that we are spiritual warriors with the victory that has already been paid in blood by you. And Father, now the victory is right before us. And we are at the walls of Jericho. Only the trumpets now must be blown by the army of the lions that are gathering to protect you, Father. To stand with you, for you, and lift you high and higher and higher than ever before. Father, we thank you for the victory that you have already given to your people. And we see Satan is fleeing right now. All his power and his strongholds are being broken right now. The chains of bondage on the people of God are breaking right now. The queen is being freed from her bondage right now. And we declare this. We declare with the power and authority in all of heaven and earth. In our own names, we lift you up. And in your precious name, we pray. Amen and adieu. All right, let's give God some praise, everybody. Let's have a praise If there's anybody who needs prayer, let's come on down. If you need prayer for your life, you are the lion of Jesus. Tell your neighbor, we are lions, lionesses of the lion of Jesus. Woo!
If you want prayer, come down, guys. If you want to pray with me, uh, we want to pray together, stand with you in this time. Let's just come down. If you, anybody needs prayer, anybody needs to stand, you want to pray for mother right now, come down. If you want to agree with God, the victory is ours. Come down. You want to pray for me, come down. Let's pray for her freedom. Let's pray for her to be released. Let's pray. Let's declare it. Let's declare the victory that is ready here. It's in front of us. It's right here. The Spirit is so powerful in this place. Oh, Lord. Just put your hand on your neighbor's shoulder. Just put it on your shoulder. Let's agree. Let's agree. Let's agree. Heavenly Father, look at your people standing before your altar. Your altar is not desecrated anymore, Father. The lions of Judah are rising. Your altar is no more a place of desolation where you have been chased out. We are now making the way so that your throne can come back in glory. Father, thank you for this time and this place in history where we can stand and the hyenas now can hear the roars of the lions that are roaring and rumbling from underneath. The depths of the earth are being shaken at its root. And Satan, the enemy, is a coward. And he's an illusory in his strength. He's a weakling before you. And Father, we are filled with your power. For you said, not by might, not by power, but by your spirit, we shall triumph. Lord, right now, with all our brothers and sisters, your chosen people, with your blood, anoint them right now. Give us the helmet of salvation. Put it on our head right now. Lord, put on the breastplate of righteousness right now on our chest. Lord, shod our feet with the gospel of peace. Right now, we have new shoes. Lord, give us the shield of faith right now in our left hand. And in our right hand, the spirit of the word. Your sword that will cut deeper than any two-edged sword that will slay and go to the bone marrow will chase out, cut away deception, illusion, and bring your victory to your kingdom. We thank you, Lord, for we are victors, not victims, and our mother is going to be free because the power is now. It is here. The anointing is now. It is here. The spirit is now. It is here. We are being filled with your power right now. And every single one of us as we rise up and shout and roar and begin to praise you, the walls of Jericho crumble before our eyes. Thank you, Lord. Give God's praise, everybody. Hug your neighbor, guys. Give, give your neighbor a big hug. I need a hug. Come on, guys. Give me a hug. Oh, God. Oh, God.